Oh, and I work in the University of East Anglia's public events team. Thank you all for coming today. I'd like to advise you of some safety procedures before we start today. We're not expecting a fire alarm test, so if it does sound, it's genuine. If this happens, please follow a member of the events team to the nearest fire exit. And if you do need any additional assistance uh, leaving in the case of a fire alarm, please make yourself known to a member of the team. With that done, I'd now like to introduce your speakers for this event. Our chairperson for the event uh, on the right-hand side here is Michael Hornberger. He's Professor of Applied Dementia Research in Norwich Medical School at the University of East Anglia. He's also the Associate Dean of Innovation for UBA's Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences, as well as Director of Aging Research for the Norfolk and Suffolk Mental Health Trust. Uh, Sheng, to his uh, side there, is a lecturer in UEA's School of Pharmacy. Sheng leads on research that aims to personalize medicines using 3D printing technology by producing pills that contain accurate dose and drug combinations tailored to individual patients. Then next along our line is Jordan, an academic clinical fellow in rheumatology based at the Norfolk and Norwich University Hospital and Norwich Medical School. Jordan's work includes patient-focused -focus projects aimed at alleviating chronic pain using virtual reality interventions. Excuse me, I'm going back and forth in my thing so I get the speaker order right. To Jordan's right-hand side, there is Stephanie, who is a lecturer in UEA School of Psychology. Stephanie and her team are working on technical interventions that could help to rewire the brain after injury, such as stroke. And then last, but definitely not least, is Dennis, Associate Postgraduate Dean for G Digital Innovation and Clinical Entrepreneurs at the East of England Deanery, Health Education England. Uh, Dennis combines his clinical background in neurology and stroke medicine with an interest in the utility of artificial intelligence in medicine, particularly image recognition and natural language processing. So without further ado, please give a round of applause and welcome our panel. Thank you. Thank you for a very kind introduction, Rachel, and delighted to be here, of course, today as my role as Associate Dean for Innovation. So just to give you an, an overview in terms of tech in healthcare is, of course, a hugely important element. And when people think of technology, they always think that it's something really new. But of course, technology has been in healthcare for many centuries. And I always give this example of Sir Thomas Orbert which many of you might have never heard of, but you have all used this invention, which is the clinical thermometer he invented in the 19th century. So before that, thermometers and fevers were known to clinicians for many centuries, but only his invention of actually a clinical thermometer made it possible to measure it, actually, and it's, of course, used every day in healthcare. And even in COVID, of course, has been fever, been one of the main kind of diagnostic features. So I'm really delighted to, to showcase to you some of the kind of the leading innovation which is happening at UEA, but also with our NHS partners, uh, which I think is really exciting and hopefully, like Sir Thomas Albert's invention, will be the future and everybody will use it in the future without even thinking about it. So I'm delighted to introduce first Shen Qi from the School of Pharmacy. Morning, everybody. Okay, so, oh yeah, it is on. Right, so, uh, good morning everybody. So, uh, as Rachel mentioned early on, my research within my research lab at the School of Pharmacy at the University of East Anglia is, um, or part of our research is on how to use 3D printing to make medicine, to make personalized medicine, so the medicine for you. So, not medicine coming from a box, a generic one, but it's tailored to you. But before I go into how you 3D print a medicine, I want to start with uh, what really 3D means, okay? So if you look at the image, uh, on the left is a flat 2D image, on the right is a 3D. So the difference is in 3D, you have three directions of X, Y, and Z. So you have a depth, a height. So how we normally make 3D objects, you know, in our daily life, we use pretty much everything you look around, even the plugs, they are 3D, how they are made. So our um, mobile phone cases, they are 3D. 
and it's one of the most typical examples of how 3D a lot of uh, applicants we use in daily life is made. So that's why I pick it. Everybody has a phone and everybody has a phone case. So a lot of 3D objects are made by molding. So you start with a mold and you inject the material into the mold. Okay, so this is so-called injection molding. So you would have um, the laser point, I think, is run out of charge. Um, you would have the plastic material goes into the machine, and the machine would melt the material, which then feed into the mold, and that comes out as your object. Okay, and as everybody possibly were trying to reduce to use plastic bottles, we use water bottles. Those are all injection molded. So a, a hundred thousand items we use on a daily basis, they are injection molded. And they are super fast. So 15 seconds per iPhone case. But it's not as fast as how fast we're making medicine. So how most of the medicine tablets, capsules are made, well, capsules slightly different, but tablet, they are also made from a mold. So we you start with powders. So your drug with your recipients as powders, they fit into a mold, a metal mold. They've been compressed under very high pressure, and that's come out of our tablet. All right, and that is even faster. So a tableting machine can produce two hundred thousand tablets per hour, and that is the speed. And that's why your paracetamol tablets is really cheap because of the high throughput as well as those drugs are out of their patent period, so the big pharma companies can claim big money. Okay, so those tablets, although they are made very fast, and that's how actually the pharma companies can make money, they cannot make each individual type of the, the medication as well as the dose for each patient because we are all different in size and shape and our response to medication. So this is the most commonly prescribed, or one of the most commonly prescribed um, high blood pressure management drug on the NHS, and this is one of the NHS um, used brand. We all only have three different types of doses. You can get 20 milligrams, 10 milligrams, or five. If you're somebody in between need 15 milligrams, you will have to do something different. And about, Two thirds of us for occasionally different type of medications because we're not getting the right dose and we often have um, side effects, more severe side effects than we really should experience, okay? And that is how severe it is in terms of the dose could um, impact on us and we are all different genetically. The best solution at the moment, and people may see this, and this is still, this is the, the review from October 2021, best pill cutters. So if people are using medications which has to uh, tailor the dose to themselves, which doesn't have the one on the market commercially available to them, you possibly seen pill cutters like this. And even more, we are having a very uh, fast aging population. And we know there are a high proportion of our population over 65 would take at least five medications per day. So they are burdened with loads of tablets to take every single day. And how you can really reduce the number of tablets people need to take, as well as tailor that combination of different drugs and the dose of the drugs needed for each patient for themselves. We proposed, um, well, not only ourselves, there's a whole um, global uh, research effort um, currently um, is working on um, is to use 3D printing. This month to be reduced. Ah, okay, they are reduced. So these are three different types of 3D printing technologies, which we can now, using a small kind of um, microwave size machines to be able to print a tablet for each individual patient. So we have the one on your um, right um, that is printing a very fast dissolvable, like your Evervincent tablet. The one in the middle is printing um, a, a wound dressing, so um, particularly um, tailored for a special patient. And then the one on the left is printing tablets. So the tablet tailored for each patient for their, their, their weight, their needed drug combinations and their dose. 
And this is what we meant in terms of a personalized, really personalized to you, tailor it to you, depending on the size, the age. We often neglect particularly our pediatric um, and elderly patient population. Elderly patients often experience problems with swelling difficulties, so most of the, the, the solid tablets are quite tricky for them, and that applies the same to the infants and the children, and we really have to um, you know, struggle and make specials for them. So this 3D printing would make them much easier to make a patient, special patient group friendly dosage forms and products for themselves. And 3D printing is not very far from us. Actually, in our NHS, this has been used um, a lot. So um, what you see on the bottom uh, right, and that um, plastic bits are 3D printed um, surgical uh, guides. So those are particularly printed for each individual surgical procedure tailored to each patient. And our NHS has been using this for the past 15 years. You know, we may not aware of it, but actually um, around the UK, there are about eight to 10 trusts. They have their own in-hospital 3D printing facility, printing these type of surgical guides um, and models to train their um, junior surgeons to communicate their patient. So you can see which part of your body um, are having the disease, are being treated, and how it's being treated. Um, and I can actually personally own a pair of those aligners uh, for my teeth. Those are 3D printed, so you get the mode um, of your teeth that's been scanned um, into the, the computer, that's been converted into a file for 3D printer to print out exactly, um, you know, cover um, the, the outliner of, um, of your teeth. So 3D printing is not far, we just need to look around us and they are already in our uh, life and penetrate into our healthcare. My final slide is saying actually what uh, my team and our, our group is doing. Um, so I'm leading a group called um, uh, Point of Care 3D Printing. This is under the UEA Health and Social um, uh, Partners. So we are working with our NHS uh, partners Within our Norfolk and Suffolk region, we actually do not have one of those in-hospital 3D printing facilities. So our patients are still relying on using outsourced um, services in the US, in Germany, for those 3D printing um, you know, surgical uh, guides or um, medical uh, devices we needed. So we are um, trying to look into how we can set up our own regional facility where our patient can access much cheaper and quicker uh, and better treatment. So welcome to visit our site. And finally, do visit um, us um, in the tent outside the forum. So this is my group this morning. They just set up their um, exhibition. They have a lot of interactive games um, for children um, to play with, to learn how, to, how medicine works in our body and um, um, how to do 3D printing. So we do have a printer. Um, on site for you to play with as well. So that's all from me. Thank you very much for listening. Can you hear me? Just about. So, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Jordan. I'm a rheumatology doctor by background, but have very strong interest in using virtual reality for the treatment of conditions like chronic pain. So today I'm going to talk to you about how we're using virtual reality at UEA to treat chronic pain in its infancy. So I'm going to talk you through what the burden of chronic pain is, what is chronic pain, and how is it impacting on people in the UK. I'm then going to talk to you about virtual reality and how we're using it for chronic pain, how it has been used in different areas for pain. Then a bit about the study which we've been just conducting called the VIPER study, its methodology, some preliminary results, and finally a little bit on the future of VR for chronic pain and other conditions as well. So firstly, a little bit about pain. So all of us have, have experienced pain from time to time. You know, we, we stub our toe on that awkward step when we get out the house. We put our hand into the oven without an oven glove very stupidly for the tenth time in a week and we burn our fingers. We uh, injure ourselves running or playing sports. But generally, those short-term insults only last for a short period of time. You, know, you might take some paracetamol, some ibuprofen, make you feel better, and then finally the pain goes away as the body heals. Well, what happens in chronic pain is that either after repeated insults or because the brain is not using and, and adapting to pain as it should do, people suffer from 
chronic, it's going out without me. People suffer from pain which lasts for at least three months or more, called chronic pain. And in some conditions, we know that actually you can get chronic pain all over the body for no really well understood reason. The numbers are pretty shocking. So 23 million people in the UK suffer from chronic pain. That's about 43% of the population. And about 3.6 million of those suffer from something called fibromyalgia syndrome, which is chronic widespread pain across the body with no real understandable reason for it. And unfortunately, you know, you and me would take ibuprofen or paracetamol to help with our short-term pain. These sorts of drugs don't work very well in chronic pain conditions. And actually, the guidelines in the UK and Europe suggest that we should be using things like physiotherapy, psychological therapies, and other types of therapies to try and reduce chronic pain and help people manage it. But unfortunately, the accessibility in the UK is completely varied. The NHS uh, has its limitations, is absolutely fantastic for the most part, but unfortunately, some of these treatments aren't available to our patients. And that often means that things like morphine are prescribed for people. And, and I'm sure you don't need to be told by me that morphine has lots of side effects and unfortunately can cause lots of problems. And the US has a massive epidemic of morphine overprescribing. So we really need some innovative treatments that we can use at home that are effective and that are non, uh, haven't got lots of side effects, so are non-harmful to our patients. So here comes virtual reality. So what is virtual reality? Just a quick uh, survey of the room. Hands up if you've ever used virtual reality. So that's, that's pretty good. So that's, I was not expecting that. Usually when I say this, people, no one puts their hands up. They don't know what I'm talking about. They leave the room, they're not really. Um, so that's pretty good. So most people in the room, or at least half of you, have used virtual reality. For those who haven't, it's hard to describe what it is, but it's using a head-mounted display to show an immersive experience. So you get a completely 360-degree 3D experience where you feel completely immersed in that virtual world, and it can transport people from their normal environment to a virtual environment. And that can be incredibly powerful. So why might it be useful for pain? Well, firstly, it's accessible in the home setting. Lots of people have got VR headsets these days, but it's becoming much more accessible. Secondly, there are unique possibilities through immersion that we can't do outside of a virtual world. Thirdly, actually, you can hijack the brain with sensor, sensations from visual and auditory um, elements of virtual reality. And actually, we can reduce pain through that mechanism. But unfortunately, there are some good sides of VR. As you can see on the left, this guy's having a fantastic time flying through the virtual world. On the right, unfortunately, it's probably a horror experience and she's not having a great time. So we've got to design these interventions intelligently with our patients at hand. So a little bit about the evidence quickly. So VR for acute pain, that's that short-term pain. There's been some good studies in the US showing that there's significant reductions with VR over just watching a, a sort of health-related video, a 2D video, like we would normally do for distraction therapy. Um, and actually, pain relief persists for up to 72 hours in some people, which is quite a long period of time after taking the headset off. And actually, there's some really clever MRI studies that have shown that when using VR, you can see there's pain reduction in the areas, or, or there's, there's reduction in activity in the areas related to pain processing in the brain. But with chronic pain, we know that chronic pain is a completely different entity. It uses, there's lots of things that impact on why people suffer from chronic pain through the social environment, the psychological environment, lots of different reasons. And we know there's lots of different pain conditions and types. And unfortunately, the studies thus far have been pretty small with small numbers and widely varied cohorts of people. So this study on the right-hand side by Jones et al. showed that there was an average reduction by about a third by using a virtual reality intervention in people with chronic pain. But we need bigger studies and we need more sort of targeted studies to, to give us an idea about what's going on. So that leads me on to our study, the Viper study. This has been a sort of two-year collaboration with our industry partners, Orbital Media. We've had to get people from pain expertise, myself and, and colleagues from, the, from Adam Brooks University Hospital, computer science expertise, psychology, uh, neurosciences, game design. And we've been really fortunate to get funding from multiple different funders to allow us to do this, because without them, we wouldn't be, able, we wouldn't be here today. Um, and we, it's quite a big study, so I'm just going to explain a little bit about each of them. We tried to dissect a VR I intervention into its constituent parts. So we looked at envi different VR environments. We looked at different pieces of technology that's available to people today. We looked at different tasks and games in VR. And we created something called a brain-computer interface where you can control the virtual environment just by thinking about certain things without even using your hands. 
And we use patients, or we, we, we uh, recruit patients, sorry, from, from the Norfolk and Norwich, from Addenbrooke's, with um, chronic widespread pain. And I'm going to talk to you about each one very quickly. So the first ex experiment was looking at different types of technologies. And this, on the left-hand side, you can see the Gear VR, which is actually a smartphone-based virtual reality headset. On the right-hand side, we've got the Oculus Rift S, which is a computer-tethered headset. And actually, I've got one at the back that if you'd like to uh, experience what we've been doing afterwards, you can, you're free to come over and have a go. Then two VR environments, we looked at a cold versus a warm environment. So because we know that people with fibromyalgia often um, find that the warm, uh, and actually anyone with joint problems, often find that the warm environments make them feel better. So we wanted to look at the difference between cold and warm. Um, and we also looked at people's brain waves whilst they were undertaking the VR intervention. We looked at four different tasks in VR. So everything from a memory-based task to a distraction activity-based task to a visio-spatial task where you had to do things and match things in, in the sort of virtual world, to a multi, uh, multitasking management-based task. It's, they all had sort of a farming and, and re relaxing sort of um, background to them. And then finally, we're still, still, still in development, as you can imagine. It's not as simple as putting two and two together. It's pretty difficult to create a brain-computer interface where you control things with your mind. But we are in the process of using AI, and you'll learn a bit more about that with um, uh, Dr. Pack's work later, um, to, to control a virtual environment whilst just thinking about certain tasks. Here is a short video, if it plays, hopefully. Yeah, lovely. Um, sort of outlining the experience. So this is one of our four different games. Now, what you can't quite understand is that when you've got the headset on, it feels like you're actually on the boat traveling down this river, and you have these targets popping up. So you, this is actually one of our participants using this. So you use the controllers to target the, the targets, and you press to shoot them. And you get a better score if you hit the middle compared to the outside. Now, the, the, the graphics are a little bit blocky, but the reason for that is because we had to make this accessible across all of those four devices. So this had to be runnable on a smartphone. Um, so we had to sort of down-regulate the, the graphics for that. So um, maybe our next one will be a photorealistic experience of going down the Nile or something. Um, as you can see, it's, it's relaxing. You can't quite hear, but there's sort of bird tones in the background. You can actually see your breath as you breathe out because it's a cold environment, this one. And you're having to hit these targets as you go along. And this person has got 155. I think our top score was about 240. And I was the person that gave that score <laughs> after the 15th attempt. Um, and now you, you'll see, just by the click of a button, you can actually change the virtual environment from cold to warm. Um, and a lot of those things that you see, the snow, the sort of changes in, your, in, the, in the breath, all, all disappear with this. OK, a little bit about our results. So uh, our participants, this is 13 participants. This is the data collection we did up till Christmas time, and we had to stop because of COVID, unfortunately. We've recommenced, and we've got our final data now, which is great. High levels of accept acceptability, so people found it immersive. They found it tolerable. Low levels of side effects with this intervention. Pain reduced by about 48.2%, so nearly 50% with this. Um, and that's after using four headsets over a period of about 20 minutes with the VR interventions. And finally, 100% of our participants agreed that they'd like to use VR in the future for their pain management. So that's the most important thing for me. If, if, if our participants said, actually, I don't want to use this again, then we might as well just stop uh, and, and, and change tact. But people are really excited about it. And what about the future? Well, I'm hoping in the next five to 10 years or so, maybe even sooner than that, that actually we'll be able to prescribe VR for our patients. And we'll be able to use personalized interventions based on how our patients, you know, our, our patients' preferences, but also their conditions. And I have to just say thank you to our fantastic colleagues, our amazing funders, but more importantly, the brilliant participants that in were involved in our study. So thank you very much. Oh, stop. <laughs> Sorry. It's because I've got extra slides or anything. You've seen nothing. There we go. <laughs> Can you hear me all right? Just checking the mic's on. Great, cool. So I'm Stephanie Rossett, and um, I lead a team at UEA, and, and we work on how to develop new tech, a bit like the other speakers, to help stroke survivors or people with brain injury. So I'm going to tell you a bit about some of the cool studies we're doing now. So we know that stroke is very common in the population, and Currently, there's around 1.3 million stroke survivors living in the UK. Two-thirds of stroke survivors live hospital with a disability. 
And we know that it, depending on where you have a stroke, that this will impair your ability to understand, organize, memorize information that you see that, and how you perceive the world. And one of the most common cognitive problems that people present after stroke is something called inattention. And this has puzzled neurologists for more than a century. So we still don't know why it happens, but I'll tell you a little bit about it today. So inattention is a puzzling condition in which you're not aware of anything on one side of your body. And usually it's the side in which you've lost your movement, so your impaired sight. It's not like you're blind or that your eyes aren't working, but your eyes are fine, but your brain doesn't know that anything's missing. So imagine one day you wake up and half the world is gone. So this is what happens to these patients. And they don't even know that that half is gone. So it's very puzzling. This usually is associated with damage to an area of the brain that a neuroscientist called the parietal lobe. And this area is quite important for us to attend, so focus our attention in particular parts of space. So this is why this, we think that this condition happens. These patients have lesions there after their stroke. So here are some examples of what our patients describe. So here's a drawing and one of our recent patients in which we asked them to draw a body of a person. And you can see that they drew only very well the right side of the person. So this participant specifically had a stroke on their right hemisphere. So they have problems with the left side of space. One thing that they commonly report as well is that they miss items on the left side of the world. So for example, when they're eating, they will only eat one side of the plate and completely forget to eat the, the, the left side. And also, this is another example. You and I, when we look down, you're sitting in your chairs right, right now or at home in your couch. And if you look down, you can see two hands, two legs. But this is what a neglect patient will see or a patient with inattention. The patients themselves tell us it's quite frightening and they can't do normal things like watch television or even read a book because they'll miss off the page. And they say, importantly, that there is not enough support at home. So this is what we're working on. My team is trying to develop therapy that we can take into people's houses. So inattention is very frequent, so we know that it happens in one in three stroke survivors. So that's quite a lot of people in the UK who have this condition at the moment. And it impairs rehabilitation outcome. So most patients will also have what is called an amiparesis. So they'll have paralysis on their arm and leg. And if you try and rehabilitate that side of the body, because they have an attention, this will impair their physical rehabilitation as well. So it has a knock-on effect. So if you have neglect, or inattention after your stroke, you will tend to have a major disability, which will be long lasting. And it's also associated with greater burden and stress in carers. And if you ask the patients, the clinicians, the carers, it's one of the top 10 research priorities. But unfortunately, there's no effective rehabilitation at present. So at UVA, we're trying to do something a little bit different than traditional therapy. In the clinic, what therapists do is they tend to cue the patient to look to their impaired side. So for example, look to the left, remember to look to the left. But because the patients can't remember to do this in the first place, in case they don't know that anything's missing, this actually doesn't work. So what we're trying to do is to use hand actions and eye movements to see if that will trigger their awareness and improve their attention. So kind of trying to break puzzles in a way to see if they'll improve their cognition. And we develop all our tools, just like the previous speaker, working with end users. So we've had great help from stroke survivors, charities, clinicians, to try and do things like develop games that they can play in front of the television or iPad uh, kind of applications. And we're testing currently these tools in people's own homes. So why use tech in the first place? Well, because we've worked with patients and they tell us that compared to traditional rehab, where for example, you're kind of moving your arms repeatedly or doing a cognitive task over and over again, like reading a, a page, this kind of gaming actually increases their in engagement and enjoyment of the therapy. And it also, because all our therapies are done by the patients themselves at home, they feel like they're more self, they have an increased self-efficacy. So they feel like they're succeeding by doing this. And importantly, from the clinical side, you can monitor rehabilitation. So how well Mr. John's doing his homework from home. 
So you can feed the data back to the NHS and this increases efficiency because the therapist doesn't have to travel all the time to people's homes and it also produces a lot of data. So we can actually monitor how well people are engaging with their therapy. So this is a specific therapy that we've been working on for inattention in which we try to get stroke patients to learn to balance objects. So the idea here is that I've got a video to show you. It's a very simple kind of game or exercise in which the patient just has to reach out for the rods and lift them up until they're balanced. Now, you and I would do this relatively easily, but a patient with an attention will actually grasp too much to one side of the rod, so when they lift it up, the, the rod won't be balanced, but it'll be tilted. And it's their job to fix their hand position so that eventually the rod's balanced. The therapist doesn't give any feedback to the person. The person has to kind of crack the puzzle. And we found in a small study that by doing this repeatedly in people's homes, you can see this is very low cost, three sticks and a mat, about 10 quid. Um, and you can see that uh, the patients who did the intervention improved a lot on their inattention. So they're not just got better at balancing objects, but actually they started to find more things on their impaired side, which is really important. But uh, however, doing this at home when you have visual deficits like these patients isn't so easy. So that's why we've turned it into a computerized intervention. So we take this into people's houses. So we have a portable low cost motion tracking system, which is a Kinect. Some of you may have used it in your gaming at home. And they, it presents the instructions on the computer screen. Uh, and these are both visually and auditorily. And we take picnic tables with mats and rods. So they do the exercises at home. So I'll show you a video. Oh, what have I done? Uh, OK. until it's balanced. Once balanced, raise your hand. Begin. So you can see the motion tracking detects how many lifts the person's done until they reach the balanced um, object. And it takes them through the rehabilitation exercise at home so they don't need the therapist there all the time, only in the beginning to teach them how to use it. So we've started testing this in the real world. So um, we've run a first, a little pilot study in which we um, brought this uh, into people's across the East Anglia houses. So you can see this is a converted barn. So a very typical house in Norfolk. And we found some really promising results again. So overall, we're getting about a thousand repetitions. So that means that the people are lifting these rods about a thousand times. And we find that after the therapy, again, they start to look more to the left. And in fact, this particular person, uh, their family reported that they had a party at the weekend. And for the first time, the individual started to look to the left. So that was quite encouraging. But obviously, this is a very small study. So we have to be careful what we say. So we're very lucky that we have funding from the Stroke Association now, and we're running a feasibility trial across the east of England. So we have all these hospitals who are recruiting for us, including NNUH and CHNC. We have uh, Addenbrooke's as well. And it started fully in May. It was meant to start a year ago, but obviously we couldn't do that. And we've trained eight therapists so far. So they go in with all the kits, set it up themselves, train the patient to do it. And so far we've had 15 stroke patients doing the trial. So if you're interested in taking part, uh, reach out to me. The other final thing I wanted to mention is that we're also looking at whether we can use automatic eye movements to kind of improve the attention to the left. So as I told you, if you keep reminding the patient to look to the left, that doesn't work because when they're on their own, they won't remember themselves. So here what we've developed is an AI-based therapy uh, in which we're, we're looking at a tablet, and the tablet has a camera that measures the eye movement, so we use artificial intelligence to make the game more engaging, and we're looking at these motion patterns. It's quite psychedelic when you're looking at it, and it, they make your eyes move automatically to the left. So by doing this, we can also have a home-based therapy that is very portable and low cost. And we're currently recruiting participants for that as well. 
So finally, I wanted to uh, uh, finish the talk by on a positive note for people who aspire to be a neuroscientist or rehabilitation scientist that for me, I tech home rehabilitation is a bit like being an astronaut. So you have to take all your kit, a bit like an astronaut, has to pack it all well to go into people's houses. But also, you have to remote, this is remote, so a bit like the therapist in Norwich who has to travel all around the state of Norfolk uh, to, the, to go into people's houses. By doing tele-rehab, you don't have to travel anymore. So it's a bit like being an astronaut because you're remote monitoring people's rehabilitation. So finally, I want to thank the team, which are absolutely fantastic, the funders, and also the clinical sites and the participants. Thank you. I'm just checking your micro microphone. Again. Can you all hear me well? Okay, great. So um, I'm Dennis Park. I'm a postgraduate associate dean for digital innovations and clinical entrepreneurs for the east of England. Essentially, what it means, uh, my role is to ensure that we prepare doctors and, and healthcare professionals in general for the future environment uh, where technologies are a big part of that environment. So you've heard about these amazing innovations. You, you're talking about gamification of rehab, um, virtual reality, 3D printing. But perhaps you might have a question. How do we find that problem? How do we train people to solve that problem? And how do we make sure that this uh, solution is effective and this solution is not just clinically effective but also cost effective and also that it's safe for patients and clinicians to use? So I just want to tell you about a um, few programs that we have for doctors and healthcare professionals in general and to tell you about innovations that they led to um, in, 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 in hospital settings. Uh, so this is just an example. There are many accelerators uh, that help uh, not just clinicians and healthcare professionals in general to develop their ideas, but one of the programs in particular is NHS England Clinical Entrepreneurs Program. is one of the biggest in the world now to develop innovations. And last year they started including patients. So what does that mean? As a healthcare professional or as a patient, you know what the problem is. What you do like sometimes, you do not have the skill to build a product. You do not necessarily have the business acumen to, to develop that product and actually to introduce it into the system. So we've got a national program, Clinical Entrepreneurs Regional, which is a digital health and entrepreneurship fellowship. This is a program for doctors that will be leading innovations in the system. And then we also support medical students at the Norwich Medical School. If they have some ideas, we have a module that helps them to uh, obtain these skills. I think the best way to tell about one of the programs, national program, is just to show you this short video that is self-explaining. What is the Clinical Entrepreneur Program? It's a program for healthcare professionals who want to expand and utilize their skill sets in innovation. They want to solve a problem, they see a problem, they see a need, and they are creative enough to find a way to solve that. It's all about empowering frontline clinicians to solve the problems that they see around them every day. The commercial skills, knowledge and expertise that you'll pick up on the programme are incredibly difficult to pick up as a clinician and they've really helped me in my progress. Coming from a clinical background and not really having any business acumen, it's just been incredible in terms of the mentorship, uh, the pit stops, learning from other entrepreneurs who are way ahead of in their entrepreneurial journeys than I am, uh, really fantastic, so thank you to all of you has been a fantastic opportunity for myself and my company. For me on a personal level, I've got to network with so many different individuals and other really interesting professionals who have great ideas for the NHS. And on a company level, we've had great introductions and it's only going to lead to better and better successes. Thanks for engaging my NHS Trust, opening up the Australian market, the valuable introductions, promoting the business and just being a, a really strong source of support. The Clinical Entrepreneur Program has been a way of refining my pitch uh, and it's given me access uh, to lots of other people trying to innovate just like I am when previously I thought that I was perhaps one of the only ones. Uh, so the, the network's been fantastic and, uh, and I think the, the access that we get to, um, to big companies uh, both for support and for pitching and 
uh, for potential investment is brilliant. Um, fully enjoy the programme and hope to stay on it for as long as I can. I started the Doctor's Cushion as a passion project, really as a mechanism to try and teach the public about how they can eat their way to health. And what started as just me being on YouTube and doing a few videos has kind of snowballed into books and a, a widening platform with a quarter of a million followers uh, and now a digital application. And that wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for the Clinical Entrepreneurship Program. They are an incredible accelerator of not just connection and community amongst other entrepreneurs and other innovators in, in the healthcare space, but also uh, a way of allowing permission and giving us the confidence to actually follow how to scale our individual uh, ambitions and individual projects. I joined the Clinical Entrepreneur Programme in 2019 and I'm loving it. And I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. Welcome to the programme. As you can see, the best way to find that problem is actually engage healthcare professionals and patients because they do see these problems every day. And I will just show you a few examples now on how these problems were found and what solutions were developed. Um, so you, on your left side, you can see um, Arshkal Rai, he's an orthopedic surgeon. And he felt quite frustrated that actually one of the surgeries had to be canceled because the bulb has gone and they actually had to uh, postpone the surgery by several weeks. Uh, so the initial idea was to develop that up that would help to report the problem saying the, the equipment is broken uh, and then it would speed up the process because normally what happens if something is broken you have to log a call and it takes a couple of days until somebody else comes in um, to, to have a look at the problem then it takes another few weeks to replace this, this equipment but it led to something really amazing in a few years since he started his, his, um, his project so they managed to use artificial intelligence to be precise as a machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence to analyze the data from all equipment failures I think they analyzed over 100,000 equipment failures. And what actually happened, they were able to predict when this piece of equipment will fail. So for example, they can say that this ECG machine will break in three to six months. You can probably imagine how helpful this is for the trust because they can replace something before it even breaks. The second example, you can see in the middle, Tamsin uh, Holland Brown. Um, she's a pediatrician. Again, so she saw a problem with uh, children having hearing issues. So this is a condition called glue ear and um, it's quite common in children and what happens whenever they get a cold or flu um, they have some fluid accumulated in their ears and that actually reduces their hearing. All this is a temporary reduction but as you know that small children they have these you know minor illnesses very frequently it actually leads to develop to, um, to slowing their uh, speech development and actually reading development. Um, so you, the problem here is that it's not really feasible to provide a child with a hearing aid for six months because the hearing aid <coughs> itself costs over £2,000. Um, so she came up with that idea of a budget solution. So she developed a product that doesn't cost more than £100. I think it opened new opportunities because that will help children to learn to talk, learn to read, and actually to, to live, live their lives uh, independently. Um, the example on the right um, is a particular find interesting that these are two medical students. So when they came on the program, they had this ambitious idea to use drones um, for healthcare. They didn't quite know how to use these drones. And they were taken into that project just based on, well, that, that sounds interesting. But what happened during COVID, the environment actually changed. There was a different need. And they secured collaboration uh, with the UK Space Agency. So what they do now, they're actually trialing drones for deliveries of um, chemotherapy. But they went even further. So in the future, they're developing corridors for drones, safe corridors. As you, as you probably know, when you have a plane, for example, you need to have a corridor to go through so they don't clash. So in the future, clinicians will be able to just place an order, like you, you place an online order for some right, you know, shopping item, and then it will be delivered to your hospital when you need it, assuming it is available. So how amazing is that? Another example is um, Alistair. So Alistair, um, he's been working on the uh, portable ventilator. Well, before COVID pandemic, no one, was, no one was quite interested in developing a portable ventilator because we didn't see the need. And also, 
uh, just to put it in the context, to buy a ventilator cost um, in excess of £10,000. So everyone thought, well, it's a very sophisticated machine. Why would we need some sort of budget version? It doesn't make a lot of sense. But it all changed during COVID. Because we realized that we may need another ten or 20,000 um, ventilators. So how can we fund it? And you know, how we, can we produce them quickly? So he was supported by the government and actually secured collaboration with Formula One and Olympus that allowed them in six weeks to develop a portable ventilator that cost less than 100 pounds. Luckily, we did not need so many ventilators, but what it led to, it led to completely new uses of ventilators. Military setting, because this ventilator is short-lived, is disposable, it can be used up to two weeks and then you can discard it, it's not very expensive, and it's very useful. And he's also developing a project with developing countries when they cannot afford simply to buy a ventilator that costs 10,000 pounds, and that is saving lives. So this is a very good example when changing the environment leads to a new problem, and that leads to a new solution. And the last, but definitely not the least, um, Jordan might know about Elias Street. Uh, so he is the founder of a company called Innovus. When he was a medical student, he found it difficult to practice you know, basic surgical skills um, without having, a, having good Mannequin, but the problem was that they're too expensive. So as a student, you couldn't really buy something like that. So you had to go to the lab and use it, which was a limited experience. So he started making affordable surgical, uh, like suturing uh, mannequins that would, would help them. But over the years, they developed into an augmented augmented reality company. Um, Jordan talked about VR a little bit, but what augmented reality is when you take a reality, that's what we see and then add something on top of that reality. So what they do, uh, they specifically talking about one of their projects, you probably heard about the key, keyhole procedure, right? All of you have. So they're using real tools, real mannequins, but they're using that little touch of augmented reality to make it feel realistic. So for example, if you're doing a surgery, I mean simulation surgery, and you cut a part of the organ that actually may cause a bleeding, Augmented reality shows you that bleeding on the screen, although there's no bleeding inside, but you know you went into in the wrong direction and caught through that vessel. So what you can do, you can do a different maneuver to stop that bleeding, that virtual bleeding that does not actually e exist in reality. But also what it does, one of the big benefits, it actually helps you to control, we don't really know, like for example, um, how often we use our left hand or right hand, when you're using something like that and applying artificial intelligence to that, you can see how your surgical skills are improving. And I think all these innovations, they're very encouraging. And although we see recent COVID pandemic obviously like a negative experience, but it was a massive boost in developing innovations and it opened new opportunities. And I personally think that there was never a better time for developing innovations because we have the problem. These are just in one year, this is what was developed on the program. I'm not saying they were all developed whilst on the program. There were some sort of startups before. Uh, but these clinicians, healthcare professionals, they, they really contributed into healthcare. Uh, thank you very much, and I welcome any questions. Right. Now it's your turn, and uh, you can ask us any questions you might have about any of the topics you've heard. Um, so do we have any questions yet? Don't be shy. Yes, please. So the question is, um, how do you wear VR headsets oh, with, yeah. Yeah, with um, if you wear yeah. your, your glasses or spectacles? Wants to answer that one. Jordan. I'm happy to answer that, yeah. So you can see I'm wearing glasses right now, uh, and I wear virtual reality headsets over the top. So there are some uh, clever lens. The lenses inside the VR headsets, you can actually get prescription lenses. So you can do that if, you, if it's more comfortable to wear without your glasses. But most headsets these days are big enough to allow you to actually just wear them over the top. Um, and most of the time, you don't get foggied up. Uh, if you get foggied up, you might have to take it off and defog. But when that happens, you know, I kept, when I walked in here today, I was fogged up. So, you know, it's one of those things. But, yeah, you can wear it over your glasses. Yes, please. Go.
Can I just yeah. I just repeat the question for the online viewers? So whether the um, the VR can be used for more specific joint problems, actually. Yeah, so we, I, I touched on it very briefly. We had a few people that had chronic knee pain after having a n total knee replacement. And again, we had very similar outcomes from, from those people, the reductions in pain for the ones that had persistent knee pain when they were at rest. See, it's more difficult if you get pain when you're moving, having a VR headset on when you're moving about. I mean, it's theoretically possible, uh, but you've got to be a bit careful of your surroundings. You don't want to sort of walk off a cliff or something. You know, you've got to be quite careful with where you're going when you've got something that's blocking your view. But Generally, um, yes, um, there's lots of studies out there that have looked at VR in different types of pain and found it to be effective across the spectrum. But the evidence is still at its infancy, and we need to look at it a bit more in, in specific types of pain. But theoretically, yes, it would work as effectively in arthritic pains, in myalgic pains, and in other types of pains, such as ones that are a bit deeper, visceral pain, we call it. Any other questions? Yes, please, go ahead. So the question is, do you 3D, 3D print the actual drugs or only the model for the 3D drugs? Okay, so thank you very much for the question. We are printing the drugs. So you print, look like, you know, a tablet you normally would look like the same size, well, not the same size, you know, similar shape, but actually we can print in any shape. If it's for children, if it's for eat to swallow, we can print to the shape, which, you know, the patient would much easier to take it. And it actually contained the drug you would need and then the amount of drug you would need tailored for you. And we had another one, yes? Okay, so these are questions for, uh, for Jordan and for Stephanie in um, whether both their trials actually are finished and how long do they, the, the patients actually need to do the treatment? Who goes first then? Lady, ladies first. Thank you. So, great question. Um, the trials are still ongoing, so we're recruiting uh, ferociously at the moment, so please spread the word. And uh, we plan the therapy, Ooh, there's a bit of feedback, um, uh, with the patient. So it's about 10 sessions and we do half an hour after breakfast, after an hour after lunch, so they remember to do their rehab. But we get about a thousand repetitions over the total of that. But I would love to research the dosage because in, especially in brain training or cognitive rehabilitation, we don't know what the most effective dose is. So we need to do more trials to find out. Yeah, so um, our study's just finished, finished uh, a couple of months ago, um, and we're just analysing the data now. It's looking very similar to that preliminary data that I showed you, so side effects are looking low, the, the results are very, very similar with regards to the, uh, the effect and the acceptability. Um, as far as the duration is concerned, each of the interventions, each of the games are about four minutes, and we used, that number was based on other studies that have looked at similar um, interventions, but no study out there has really looked at types or, or length of, of treatment um, when it comes to VR. And actually, we found that a couple of our experiments were a bit longer. So people had to wear headsets for a bit longer than just that four minutes because we got them to play first game and we took some brain uh, signals and then we got them to play the second game, brain signals, et cetera, et cetera. And we found certainly in fibromyalgia, uh, the, our patients get a lot of fatigue and tiredness and often some eye strain as well. So um, we were finding that about halfway through, so that's after about 15, 20 minutes, people were starting to get a little bit more fatigue. So we just gave people a break for a little while, then put the headset back on, and usually that fatigue and that eye strain will go away quite quickly after taking the headset off. But it's been quite interesting to see the spectrum of people that we've included. The people that have high levels of fatigue often will struggle, struggle a bit more with VR than those that have high levels of pain and less fatigue. So there's definitely something in future, and we want to look at the sort of... Um, the, the types of patients we have and, and how they respond to different treatments in the future. Great. Any further questions? Yes, please. Hi. It's going back to drugs and 3D printing. Your slide shows some of them in gossip books with special drugs. <laughs> Are you saying that it's feasible that a person would have 
less tablets to take, it, and that's sort of possible in the near future, is it? So the question is whether the 3D printer could be also used to, to reduce the amount of uh, different tablets somebody needs to take, so maybe combine them into fewer tablets. But a prototype could fit to more than that, is it? Mm. Yes, so that, that is the aim, and that has been demonstrated um, in a research environment, so we can print you know, three, four drugs into one tablet. You know, you can layer them or you can have cages outside, fillings inside. So all those different designs and combination of designs are possible. Um, it's really how the next step reach into the clinic and to the patient. But yes, it's definitely possible and has been done, yes, in research. Okay, that's wonderful. Yes. <laughs> the, the timeline would be? Mm, I would say maybe 10. Oh, uh, uh, the question was the timeline of yeah. when they may potentially reach the patient. I would say um, the issue at the moment is with the, with the regulatory. Um, so um, we know MHRA, uh, you know, we all heard about that's the you know, approving body um, for our medications in UK. And we still need a fully matured regulatory framework for using 3D printing for drug manufacturing. Um, but that is coming because that now is currently in the public consultation for their proposal. So we're hoping in the next five to ten years, I would see. And um, there are already some very small trials, you know, involve maybe five, ten um, cancer patients um, are happening within Europe, not in the UK yet, but it will come very soon. <laughs> maybe I can ask a question to Dennis. Uh, I just wondered, in, in terms of, there's always this interesting relationship between private entrepreneurs and the NHS, which is public funded. So how is that kind of dealt with? How do people deal with that? Is the kind of, because the NHS is, is promoting this entrepreneurship, would this go back to the NHS somehow? Or is this really companies which will develop by themselves? Um, so no, thanks, that, that's a very good question. Um, so essentially, if we are talking about intellectual property, for example, um, when clinician is employed by the NHS, most trust they have a policy that they own the intellectual property for the product. But what they do, they negotiate an agreement with that healthcare professional or number of professionals on the, for example, if this product becomes something very useful and gets introduced into different trusts, so that these healthcare professionals can also benefit from developing that basis as a, as a business, as a, as a commercial as a commercial project. But you're quite right, this is a sort of complicated um, process, but the, the answer is definitely uh, the saving for the NHS from these companies. I just gave you like a few examples, let's say of a ventilator that costs like more than 10,000 pounds, and then you can suddenly use something that costs 100 pounds, you can imagine the saving. We definitely need more innovation in the NHS, yeah, yeah. so that's clear. There was a question somewhere over, oh yes, yeah. So the question was whether there were, I, I guess we would call this practice effects, whether yeah. people are, get more used to the VR yeah. and whether it would affect their pain levels the longer they yeah. use the VR and what they had to do. So just, uh, so, yeah, that's, that's something that people often worry about, the novelty effects yeah. of VR. So I can't answer that 100%. I can answer it about 80%. So our, our first experiment was looking at different headsets delivering the same VR intervention for four different headsets. And we found that actually the pain reduction was more related to people's uh, comfort of that headset rather than actually the um, time effect. So after the fourth time of using the same game on a different headset, the pain reduction was for some people was greater than the first one. So certainly over a, a, short, a shortish period of time on one experiment, we know that there isn't a great effect from that novelty, but whether if you gave someone the same intervention uh, sort of every day for six weeks, for example, whether that would Im Im impact on their pain relief, it might do, but we don't know yet. There's a study from the US by Beth Darnell and her, her group that have looked at a six-week program of VR interventions, but it included mindfulness, distraction therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, lots of different elements. And they found certainly that there was great effect after six weeks and at follow-up um, in reduction in pain. So 
I think it depends on the intervention massively, and it depends on if you use a sort of multi-mode approach with lots of different aspects of it. Um, but if you did exactly the same thing every day, uh, you'd probably get bored and stop using it. That would be the pain reduction issue. Uh, but you, potentially, you could lose that effect, I guess. It's about how immersed you feel is, is what we think is, is linked to the effect in, in pain reduction. Fantastic. And we've come to the end of our session. Um, so I'm sure the speakers are very happy. If you've been shy and didn't want to ask your question in public, you can come up to them and ask them in person. But um, if we could just give a round of applause again to the speakers. And thank you for coming. <laughs>